Okay, so now I want to talk about a really important concept called the probability mass function, or PMF. We're going to talk about this a lot going forward, uh, and then this is going to kind of inform everything else we do in, in class, right? So this is a very simple idea. The idea is that now we have a set of discrete outcomes, numerical outcomes for a discrete random variable, and now we're going to assign probabilities to each of those outcomes, and we're going to make sure that all these probabilities make sense, okay? So the PMF is defined as the following little p, little uh, big X, okay, so this is a little bit confusing. So this is little p, big X, little x. So this is basically a shorthand for saying, what is the probability that, that the discrete random variable has the outcome little x, okay? Or to be really pedantic, it's like saying, it's the probability of the set of outcomes in the sample space such that when I map those outcomes, I get the value x, okay? This is the smarter way to think about it here, okay? And so since x is a discrete random variable, this PMF is only non-zero at a discrete set of places along the real line, okay? And so it's like saying, okay, I have a set of um, possible numerical outcomes for the discrete random variable could be a finite number or it could be an infinite number. In each case, I can talk about what is the PMF at that point. And this is basically like a bar graph that says how much probability is there for each one of these possible outcomes. And so the PMF has to satisfy a bunch of rules that we inherit from the rules that we've talked about way back when in one of the earlier lectures, right? So for example, because these are probabilities of events, we know that um, there are some rules. One rule is that these values uh, have to be non-negative, right? Same as before, I can't have negative probabilities, okay? Also, if I look at the sum over um, all of the possibilities, or let's see, i equals 1 to possibly infinity, that if I add up all of these values, I have to get 1, right? That's like saying that exactly one of these numbers has to happen, and if I add up all those probabilities, I have to get a total value of 1, one unit of probability, right? So those two rules like make sense. And then, um, you know, this is just kind of a dumb way of saying the probability that X is in some set B. And again, this is like a, an interval of real numbers. That's just equal to the sum of looking at the outcomes that are in B times the, the individual probabilities of each of those outcomes, okay? so. This is just saying that if I want to find out what's the probability of a set of numbers in the real line, I look at all the discrete outcomes that lie in that set and I add up those corresponding probabilities, okay? So now what we can do is we can talk about a bunch of different random variables just by specifying their PMF, right? And so what I want to talk about for the rest of this little lecture is common um, discrete random variables and their corresponding PDFs. PMFs, sorry. Right? So we already talked about these in slightly different contexts, but now I can really formalize what I mean, right? So one really important one is called the uniform random variable. And this is just like rolling a die. That's like saying that I have n outcomes And each of those has probability 1 over n. This is like rolling a fair die and looking at the numbers 1 through 6. And each of those has probability 1 sixth, right? So one way of representing this is to draw a picture, right? Pfft, start with 2. Start with 1, right? So these are my possible numerical outcomes. 
And what I could do is I could draw these like bars on a bar graph. And each of these bars has height 1, 6. So this is kind of like a bar graph or like a histogram of how often these outcomes happen. And remember we did this kind of numerical experiment a few lessons ago where I was kind of like plotting these bars, except it wasn't the actual PMF, it was like the observed frequency of things. And kind of what we know now is that if I look at enough experiments, that bar graph of actual outcomes should eventually converge to the underlying PMF. Okay. Now, one thing that you'll often see me do in these lectures, and there's a reason for it, is to draw this not as a bar graph, but as a set of arrows like this. And these arrows have height 1 6. Now, there's a reason for this, and the reason is related to if you took a class on signals and systems. If you're like an electrical engineer, you probably took a signals class, right? And these here are technically delta functions. So there's a reason why I want to do it this way, and it's going to have to do with when we start to compute things like averages and probabilities of intervals and so on. We're going to start to do integrals. And so I can't integrate a bar graph, but I can integrate a set of delta functions. So if you don't quite understand what this means right now, don't worry about it. But it is mathematically useful to think about a PMF in this way, as we're going to see in a few lectures. Okay. Um, kind of a preview. Okay, here's the preview is to say, okay, what's, what if I wanted to know what's the probability that um, x was less than 3? The preview is that I draw the line kind of on this side of 3, and then I would integrate the PMF over this region. And as I hop over these two delta functions at 1 and 2, I would basically accrue that. 1 6 plus 1 6 equals 1 3rd, right? So in a way, I want to integrate over these delta functions. That's why I drew them like that. Okay. Again, don't worry if you, if you don't quite understand what I just said, but it will become more obvious later on. Okay. Another very common random variable is called the Bernoulli random variable. This is a really simple one. This has two outcomes, either 0, which has probability 1 minus p, or 1, which has probability p, right? So I have two numerical outcomes, 1 minus p and p. And again, I can see that these add up to 1 in total, right? And this is nothing more than a coin flip or a Thanos snap, right? Either I have success or I have failure, and I assign the probability of success to p and the probability of failure to 1 minus p, OK? We also talked about this kind of flip a coin until you get a success. And now I'm going to give that experiment a name called the geometric random variable. This is like measuring the number of Bernoulli trials I have to do until I see a success. And so that's like saying the probability of one coin flip is p. The probability that I need two coin flips is 1 minus p times p. Then I may need three flips. That's 1 minus p squared times p and so on. So the general formula for a geometric random variable is, uh, I'm going to say k, 1 minus p to the k minus 1 times p, for k equals 1 to infinity. So these are the possible uh, discrete values I can have, and this is the probability for each of those values. And I think we showed in a previous lecture that if I sum up all of these probabilities, they add up to 1 using that infinite sum formula. Okay. I will say that sometimes you see a ge geometric random variable definition that starts at 0, and there's just like a slight modification of that. But usually in class, I'm going to assume that this geometric random variable has to be at least 1. Okay. And the final one I want to talk about is what's called the binomial random variable. We've also talked about this before in a slightly different way. This is basically saying, you know, the, the probability of getting k successes in n Bernoulli trials, right? I flip a coin n times, and I count the number of heads. So here, we already know from previous lectures that the way this works is I have n choose k possible places where I could get those successes, 
and then the probability of succeeding k times is p to the k, and the probability of failing n minus k times is 1 minus p to the n minus k. And then the possible outcomes that this can take on are 0 through n. Okay? And so you may remember that we kind of did the situation where we flipped a coin six times, and assuming that this coin is fair, then the result of this will kind of look a little bit like, you know, this. Something that's big in the middle and smaller around the sides. Okay. And the last thing I'll say about this is that, you know, now I don't have to necessarily give a PMF a name. I can just like tell you here are the values. Um, kind of a preview related to the numerical experiments we did before is that um, if we don't know the PDF, In practice, we can do lots of experiments and compute or approximate that the number of times that I see the value k over the total number of trials will converge to the underlying PMF value, right? That's, you know, the way it should work. I keep on flipping the coin and I count things and hopefully that distribution will converge to the right thing. Okay, The relative frequency of what I see in the limit becomes the probability mass function. So there's one more important random variable I want to talk about, but I'm going to save it to the next mini lesson because I want to give it a special treatment all on its own. Okay, That's called the Poisson random variable. Maybe I'll see you there.